Well, Diane, thanks so much for joining us today. It's my pleasure. Thanks for inviting me. All of us now, Diane, are learning to cope during this extraordinary global pandemic. Given your strong voice in your autobiographical books and now your latest, When My Time Comes, what self-care and resilience practices have you developed and maybe what lessons have you learned over the past few weeks? Well, I think I have learned to tolerate being alone really quite well. Um, I think of myself very much as a people person and love to be out there with folks, love to be in the office, love to be out at social events. But my little dog, Bella, has been keeping me great company. I live in a condo where there are more than 240 units, which means a good number of people. And we're all wearing masks, even to go out into the hallways. And when I take Bella for a walk, I always wear my mask and even sunglasses because I gather your eyes are an opening into your body. Um, And I've been told that glasses are even better than contacts during this period. So I have learned to cope quite well. My husband of just two and a half years is down in Florida. And for that, I'm grateful, really, because he had a couple of little health problems, and he's far better being down there with his own doctor. We talk or email each day, and of course, I'm in constant contact with family and friends and loved ones, truly. It really matters. This is a time where even as we're isolating, human connectivity is so critical, is it not? No question. And you know, it's a funny thing, but even as I'm out walking, when strangers walk uh, in my direction or in the opposite direction, they'll usually walk out in the street or I will. But nevertheless, My Angelo always said to me, when you see someone on the street, whether you know them or not, say hello. And I do. Most of the time, I don't get an answer because lots of folks have earphones in and I don't walk with the earphones. I need to pay attention to Bella. So, um, and that makes me a little sad because in a time when, as you say, we are social distancing, that's the one moment when we are distanced, when we could at least connect in a little way. It's really true. And, and like you, when I'm out walking our animals, I absolutely keep my earbuds out of my ears. One, not only do I want to hear from my fellow human, it's lovely to hear nature around you just to absolutely. get a break from this. Yeah, yeah. You know, I have a funny little story to tell you. My late husband, John Rehm, had a wonderful whistle. He could whistle anything. And when we first met at the State Department all those years ago, I could hear him coming down the hall because he was whistling. And he'd imitate bird calls. And so when we were out walking, he'd hear a bird and imitate that with his whistle. And so like you, I'm listening for those bird calls. Oh, that's lovely. Really lovely. 
Well, like many of our AEW members, we're all very much enjoying your now weekly podcast as well. Thank you. Twice and, weekly. Oh, that's right. My, my apologies. Twice well, one of your weekly. most recent ones featured Arthur Kaplan, renowned medical ethicist about rationing health care during this crisis. Fairness and decisions about who gets treated and when are not always equal, as you know. How do you think the conversations we're having about healthcare right now relates to the right to die movement and patient autonomy? Well, I have seen many letters to the editor talking about the fact that indeed this is a time when you need to have had the discussion with your family members, your friends, your doctors, about what it is you want at the end of life, whether in fact you even want to be put on a ventilator. As you may know, and I'm sure your listeners do, there are a great many problems with those ventilators, not only before using them, but the after effects of those ventilators. So the other day I called my doctor and said, if I come down with the coronavirus, I do not want to be placed on a ventilator. Indeed, I don't even want to go to the hospital. Well, she pointed out to me that she agreed in regard to the ventilator. She doesn't want to be put on a ventilator either. She did, however, say to me that in a hospital, you can receive up to 60% of oxygen needed, not through a ventilator, but in other ways, whereas if you stay in the home, you can only receive 40% needed of oxygen. We talked about hospice, we talked about everything I need to know if I do come down with it and do decide to stay at home. I'm sure I'm not the only one having those conversations. We all need to, even after this COVID-19 virus is beyond us, and surely we all pray it soon, we need to talk to each other about what we want at the end of life. That's so, so true. And I think, unfortunately, sometimes it takes moments like this when we are in crisis to really illuminate all we need to personally do to protect ourselves and communicate our wishes to our loved ones. So thank you. Diane, you wrote the very candid and inspiring On My Own as you grieved the loss of your husband, John Ream. And now your latest, When My Time Comes, is a real call to action. Why was this new book and the soon-to-be-coming-out documentary so important for you at this time? And what do you think is one of the most important things to consider as we confront our own mortality or the loss of loved ones? Let me be very clear that, in fact, the documentary preceded the book when Joe Fab, the producer and director, came to me in 2016, two years after my husband died, and asked me whether I would be part of this documentary. I readily agreed because I do believe that the right to die should be a very personal choice. It was a choice my husband made and carried through on. However, in order to do that, he had to starve himself and stop drinking water 
and stop taking any medication for 10 days. It was a very long 10 days for him. And I could tell by the look on his face, it was very hard. So I don't think anybody who doesn't want to do that should be forced to do that. I think we all should be able to exercise that right to die. So when we began traveling around the country to film this documentary, talking with doctors and ministers and patients and social workers and going into hospitals and going into the homes of people who were dying, it occurred to me that a film cannot do everything and that what I wanted to do was to put in print what we had seen. And so what I began doing about six months into the filming project was to transcribe each of the interviews we did and then write an introduction to each one of those interviews, setting up what I saw, what I felt, not only what I heard, but the impressions that I had received during those interviews. And they are so important and poignant not only from the people themselves, one of whom I just heard today, one of whom who is in my book died recently, and a relative of hers contacted me to tell me that she had died and was so happy to have been part of the book. I think the message, the documentary, which will come to public television next spring, and the book will convey to people not only the importance of making those decisions for themselves, but to hear the arguments against those decisions, to know that there are members of the clergy, uh, doctors, um, people who feel strongly that they want to live as long as possible, no matter what. I talked with medical students who heard a lecture for the first time on the right to die and had not yet made up their minds until they heard that lecture. So what that says to me is that people really haven't thought about it enough. They haven't wanted to talk about it because it's too frightening to consider. And what we are trying to show is that death is part of life. And we need to understand that and to make as many preparations for that as we would for the birth of a child. It's all part of that wonderful life cycle, which we are privileged to be a part of. And so I hope that the message of the book is, and the documentary, whatever you decide, decide. 
make your plans, talk with your family, your doctors, your friends, make your plans. Yeah, I think I completely agree with you, Diane. And it was so illuminating um, through the book to really get, it's not a toggle switch of either yes or no. It's, it's the fact that you can tell all of the different shades of white to gray to charcoal gray to black on these issues and come back again to make decisions for yourself. You know, for so many of us, we're, we're afraid to talk about money with our loved ones. We're certainly afraid to talk about death. Can you talk to us a little bit about your own very personal conversations with your grandson um, about your wishes? My grandson is now a sophomore at Dartmouth. He was a freshman when he and I first talked. And... First of all, I asked his mother's permission, my daughter, because you never do anything with your grandchildren without asking parents first. So Ben happened to be here while we were filming here in my apartment. And I asked him whether he'd be willing to talk with me about my own wishes. And he said, absolutely. So I said, here's what I want you to do. I want you to take out your cell phone. And I want you to film me as I talk with you. And as Ben was filming me, the cameraman was filming the two of us. Mm -hmm. And I told Ben that when my time comes, should it be because of physical illness or should it be because of mental deficiencies, I want him my daughter, my son, my husband, my whole family, to know that unless I can contribute to society, continue to contribute in ways that I believe are valuable, I no longer want to continue with life. Um, I have had a fabulous life, one I would never have expected. And it seems to me at 83, if I should begin to lose my mental capacity, I would not want to go on. And I asked Ben to promise to tell me when he began to notice those kinds of problems going on with me. And <laughs> he said, well, what do you want me to do about it? <laughs> and Ben is studying neuroscience. And I said, I think that by the time my time comes, you'll be in a position to know what to do. And he promised to carry out those wishes for me. So it was a very important conversation for me. And I know that Ben was on the verge of tears as we talked. And... I know that he loves me in ways that make me so happy. I mean, here I am, his grandmother, and he loves to spend time with me. So I figure I can count on this young man. And wow. that's why we carried out that conversation. 
Well, and I guarantee that Ben, just like you're reflecting on it now, is, is also still reflecting on it and the importance of these conversations. It's a true gift to be able to share these thoughts together with people we can trust in our close family. So Indeed. thank you. Thank you for sharing that. One of the individuals in the book that really stuck with me was Dan Diaz, who describes the dignity and bravery of his wife, Brittany Maynard, uh, and why he continues in this fight today. Um, maybe you could just share a little bit about both his work and what that interview was like for you. Well, I had certainly followed the story of Brittany Maynard, as we all had, and one of the interviews I really wanted to do and we knew we needed to do for the documentary was to go to his home in California and see the beauty of what he and Brittany had created with each other. Shortly after they were married, as you I'm sure know, she began having horrible, horrible headaches and was diagnosed with a brain tumor. And unfortunately, that brain tumor began growing far more quickly than anyone imagined it would. And Brittany knew she did not want to continue to suffer through that. She was having hallucinations. She was having seizures. She was losing her balance. She was really suffering. And so, because at the time, California had no right to die law, they moved to Oregon and rented a home and established residency there. And under the supervision of doctors, she did take her own life as she had said she was going to do. Talking with Dan Diaz made clear to me how precious their relationship was and how difficult the whole episode had been watching his wife suffer and go through the torment of the brain tumor, the attempts at healing, and finally the realization that she was going to die either comfortably in her own bed or in great pain and misery in a hospital, which she was not prepared to do. Dan Diaz is working on his own book, which I'm sure when it comes out will not only be filled with great love, but great detail about what the two went through, lifting their whole personal life and transforming it, transferring it to Oregon, which, you know, not many people can do either because of work or money or ability. And, and yet they did it. They managed to do it. You know, there is something you really should know, and that is that of the people who do ultimately sign up for medical aid in dying, one third of those people never use the medication. It is the control over their lives that they wish to have. And that is what is so important to them. The woman who died about whom I learned just this morning did in fact die with her doctor's supervision in California 
which now does have medical aid in dying, even though it's been challenged many times. Um, and she died exactly the way she wanted. What she said, I went and reread her chapter after I received the note this morning that she had died. She said that knowing she had the right to end her life when it became unbearable gave her the courage to then try other experiments mm -hmm. to keep her alive. When she died, she died with the doctor at her side exactly in the way she wanted to. But I thought that was so interesting that having that right had given her that courage to try to carry on. Yeah, yeah. And it is, as you said earlier, it's so much of um, control as part of it that we're able to advocate for ourselves in a way that we're not just relying on others. As brilliant as so many medical professionals are, they're not in our souls and minds. And being able to maintain that semblance of control of decision making is just so, so critical. Exactly. Yeah, thank you. Well, you and I emailed a little bit about this, Diane, but there's a funny word that neither one of us is very fond of, and that's the word retirement. And when, <laughs> <laughs> when you stepped back uh, from broadcasting on the Diane Ream show, you know, it was not at all about retirement. It was about what was next in your life. And like you, many, many of our thousands and thousands of AEW members may not be going uh, to a, a 40 or 60 hour uh, weekly job. But since you stepped back from the Diane Ream show, you've written two more books. You've launched this incredibly successful twice weekly podcast. You've been raising funds for your beloved WAAMU all in addition to getting remarried, doesn't sound at all like retirement to me. Do you think there is any such thing as retirement anymore in the 21st century? Well, for some people, there may be. I mean, you have to understand, Kim, that um, the labor of the mind is very different from the labor of the body. And there are those who've had to use their bodies in such ways that the bodies have really taken a beating. I think about coal miners in this world and the extent to which they have suffered because of the work that they do. And yet they continue to do it because that is what brings their income, their ability to feed their families. My work, and I've been so fortunate in this, my work has been more of the mind and has not taken the toll on my body um, so that for me, the word retirement has never been part of my vocabulary. I simply think retirement is going to come when I am finally no longer of this world, when my body has been cremated and my ashes spread at our beloved farm in Susquehanna County, Pennsylvania, then you can say, I will have retired. But until then, you know, work for me is a huge part of my life. My children are the most important part of my life and the most important thing I've ever done in my life. But my work is also important and I want to be able to continue that as long as I'm able. And when I feel I'm no longer able, the word retirement won't. <laughs> 
come into mind, it will be something very different. That's perfectly put. I think for, for the work that you've been doing, both in continuous learning of if exploring and ensuring that the world gets better and better and advocating for the things you believe in, those are all areas that AUW members to really relate to, and I do as well in my role, that we must continue to move forward and not backwards in how we're advocating for humanity, how we're advocating for equity in this world, and how we're ensuring that we're leaving it better for our children and grandchildren. Absolutely. You well, Diane, very well. Oh, thank you. I so thank you for joining us today. I know this is uh, these are uncertain times, times when we're all sitting in our homes reflecting, trying to continue this good work, and for you to share your time and your thoughts with us today. We're deeply appreciative. Kim, I'm really pleased to have done it and to have been in conversation with you. You're really wonderful. Well, thank you so much for being with us and please be well. Thank you.